So welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Evans. I'm director of the Tufts Cancer Center. I'm a physician scientist. My expertise is lymphoma individually, but I have the pleasure of helping coordinate all the diverse and unique enterprises you see on the slide here. And I know many people are in the room representing each of these. And you know, I think it rec represents an opportunity and challenges to coordinate all of these pieces. But I just want to congratulate Dr. Hines so far in just a fantastic inaugural symposium. Great job, Dr. Hines. Really, I mean, I've been involved in a lot of symposiums, and so far, so good. But I think it's also fair to say that TUSM is really the anchor to our scientific, cancer scientific research enterprises. And but I, the term convergence is, is very apt, because how do we figure out optimal convergence on these unique enterprises? And as you heard also, I think the answer to the question I posed to the panel, that we can't be everything to everyone. And what, what are we really good at and what can we become great at? But I think there's other layers and levels of convergence. One is just amongst these research enterprises. But the other is how do we coordinate and really converge that science so it benefits the patient? And you know, this is somewhat of a construct of all the moving parts to across the street Tufts Medical Center. And where we have primary care and all these different specialties that need to really find ways, which we do, to work together with a lot of their community health and other payer partners, et cetera, orbiting around the patient. And then we have research feeding into that and vice versa. So it's, and we have a lot of tools now, all the different therapeutics. And how do we navigate that? It's not easy, but I think we have the tools and the minds to be able to do it. And of course, it's gonna be through translational research studies, whether it's bedside to bench, bench to bedside, and we have the talent here at Tufts to do it. And so I'm just really so happy to, to, to work here, just given the expertise and the passion that everyone has. So this session is precision medicine. You know, I think like a lot of centers, we're trying to figure out, well, what does that mean to us? It's kind of like the word translational. It can mean different things. And we actually, about six months ago, formalized a precision medicine program or working group. One of the co-chairs is Dr. Clement, who will be speaking, and also Dr. Mar uh, Martel co-chairs it. But I won't read through this, but you can see at least at the outset how we defined it. And this, is, this group has been meeting twice a month, really kind of sitting around, not a campfire, but a table, and doing a couple different things. One, with scientists and how can we better kind of connect the bridge between our research and patient programs. But also, um, how we, we, we will also go through patient cases. And you heard about how you can do genomics on patients and what does it mean. And it's actually really difficult sometimes to understand what these outputs you get from a foundation one or, or others. And so how can we help patients in semi real time and also do cutting edge research at the same time? So at least that's our kind of big picture view, and, and we're, we're, again, just really happy to, to be part of this. And you know, what is the future? I, you know, the future is, tr is truly precision medicine, personalized medicine, putting it all together, which is complex, but doable. And can we get to a place where that pill has five different compounds in it, little nanoparticles, et cetera? I, I think, and it's not all about treatment, of course, prevention, diagnosis, et cetera. So I just wanted to give that quick overview of kind of what we're thinking on the big picture at the Tufts Cancer Center. But with that, we're gonna go right into our first session and I have the privilege to introduce Dr. Amy Yi. Dr. Yi is professor at Tufts University School of Medicine at DMCB and also in the Freedman School of Nutrition and Science and Policy. She's also president of AACR Boston Incorporated and as many of you know, her, her, uh, her goals of her laboratory are to understand the mechanisms of triple negative breast cancer using biochemical and genetic tools, as well as concurrent informative preclinical models. And she really has a very exciting project on compound that she's gonna tell us about. And let me pull that up. 
title of Dr. Yi's talk is Wind Signaling in Green Tea, A Tale of Breast and Brain. Okay, th th thank you for the introduction. And, um, and thank you all for, for coming to this uh, inaugural Tufts Cancer Symposium. It's been a, a great set of talks, so hopefully I'll continue in that vein. Okay, so what I'm gonna, th I'm gonna talk about is, is one of the projects in, in my lab, and, and we're focused on tri triple negative breast cancer. So this is a breast cancer su subtype for which there are few tr treatment options, and in part because it, it is negative, it's called triple negative because it's negative for many of the markers that mark breast cancer, ER negative, PR negative, HER2 her normal. Um, and it's part of the basal-like class of breast cancers, which constitute about 20% of all breast cancers. But two of the pathways that are well associated with triple negative breast cancer are the EGF receptor and, and the wind signaling pathway. Um, they're not quite separate pathways since one does inform the other. And wind signaling has been shown to be respo uh, responsible for resistance to EGFR inhibitors. In fact, this is kind of an odd cancer, and this is the only thing I'll mention about EGFR, is that there's overexpression of EGFR in triple negative disease, but these cancers are completely refractory to the EGFR inhibitors. And the wind signaling pathway has been shown to be part of that resistance. Okay. So the focus of, of our work, we focus on the, on the primary cancer, but, but we're really um, moving our focus towards metastases. Why? So 90% of breast cancer deaths are from metastases. And no matter how many years, I guess since Nixon's war on cancer, um, still 20% of breast cancers have, have metastases with little improvement in, in, in the many years. And what the, but the oncologists are, are, are pretty smart. They've gotten really good at, maintain, at, at maintenance of the metastases. That, so breast cancers go uh, from lung, bone, lung, liver, and ultimately to, to brain. So the non-cranial metastases are maintained pretty well by, by, by chemotherapy. The patients have a pretty good quality of life. But one of the consequences of that improved maintenance, an ironic consequence, is breast cancer patients, it's a good thing, are, are surviving longer. But what, ha what is happening now is that there are increased rates of eventually fatal brain metastases. Once breast cancer goes to the brain, um, the quality of life is exceptionally poor with uh, death often within months. So my thought and the thought of the field is if we can make some impact on brain metastases, we can extend the lives of breast cancer patients even longer. And my hope would be so that they die of something else, not breast cancer. But there's some challenges in that few compounds for chemotherapy cross the, 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 the blood-brain barrier. And these patients with brain metastases, they have the tumors, but they have a poor quality of life because of other co comorbidities, such, such as seizures and, and cognitive de deficits. And of course, it's, it's a horrible death with, uh, with the, the brain mess at the end. OK, so, 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 so what is our approach to, to, to triple negative breast cancers and brain metastases? So over the years, what we've done is to refine a preclinical model of triple negative disease. You need a preclinical model. And I'm a biochemist by training. And um, the cell biologist accused me of thinking of a cell as a box with a bunch of si signaling pathways, but that's what I think of them as. So you need some pathways and genes, molecular framework and tools, and you, you, you need the brains to, to, to be able to, to, to choose from all the options that we have for investigation. So, so the outline of my talk is three small parts, and I'm gonna talk about our, the, the preclinical model that we optimize to, to get brain metastases and seizures. I'm gonna talk about a specific molecular um, network, I guess, with WIT signaling and a gene we work on, HBP1, and the consequences to the, the metabolic regulation of Warburg effect. And, and lastly, I'm gonna talk about a compound combination that seems to be uh, very effective in the preclinical setting for treating brain metastases. Okay, so the approaches that we take to tumor genesis, you can use cells, um, you can use animals and, very, and specimens and bioinformatics. So we focus primarily on, on these three. Okay, so, so we use a, a, a xenograft model 
in which we implant a, tri a triple negative breast cancer line. And we use a couple. This is the workhorse one. Um, the cells themselves are tagged with GFP and, and luciferase. And one thing we do to extend the course of the experiment, but to um, optimize for metastasis, we do a surgical resection. This was suggested to us by Jack Urban sis, is sitting here a, as a way to make this model more um, like what happens to the patients in the clinic. Um, and um, we use the vast amount of tools available in the bioinformatic databases for analyzing gene expression. Okay. Oh, let's see if I can turn down the lights. Oops. <laughs> that was the other way. Uh, oh, well. Okay, so. So, so, so these are examples of, of brain metastases in, in the nod skin mice. So, so our cells are GFP tagged. So, so, so here's example of one. And in another example, sometimes the, the metastatic tumors get quite large. So, 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 so here's some of the larger, uh, larger tumors. I think this one was <laughs> almost the size of, of a hippocampus. Um, and, and, and so we are able to get not only the primary tumor growth, but also the growth to, 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 to the brain, whether it be the, the micromets or larger tumors. And, and what our, our breast cancer model um, undergoes, here, so here's an example of a mouse, is that like uh, metastatic brain cancer patients, which are often di diagnosed after a seizure or a massive headache, our, our, our mice also uh, um, exhibit seizures. So right now, there is no current animal model for metastatic tumor-associated seizures. And so this gives us a venue, ultimately, to study the origin of uh, brain metastases in, in an animal model. OK. Oops. So hmm. I was going to show you the seizing mouse, but I can't. So, so this is an example of a tumor-bearing mouse that, that was, uh, underwent a seizure shortly before we sacrificed it. And, and, and this mouse's section was one of the brain mats that I showed you. OK. OK. So, 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 so that's our model. We have a model that re goes from primary tumor. The, the cells are implanted in the mammary gland and goes all, all the way to metastases to, to the brain. There are also metastases. In, 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 in the liver and in the lung. So the, the framework for much of our studies is, is the wind signaling pathway, which I'll go through uh, uh, pre pretty uh, briefly. So the central part, uh, it's, a, it's a total signaling pathway going from receptor to activation of gene expression. The, the core element here is the beta-catenin destruction complex. The key part is to keep the, in the off state, to keep the levels of beta-catenin low so it can't go into the nucleus and activate gene expression. So as such, this is called the beta-catenin destruction complex through a phosphorylation-dependent mechanism triggers beta-catenin de de degradation. Now, when the wind signaling pathway is activated, say by binding of a wind ligand to its receptor and, and, and co-receptor, is that it, 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 the, the net consequence of that is to inhibit the beta-catenin destruction complex, leading to accumulation of beta-catenin. Beta-catenin moves into the nucleus and combines with left TCF transcription factors to activate target genes that are responsible for many parts of biology, stem cell maintenance, uh, cell, 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 cell proliferation, and, and the wind gene expression programs also uh, responsi responsible for uh, tu tumor initiation to tumor aggressiveness. So in my lab, we worked on an inhibitor of wind signaling. I have a little bit more to say about in mo a moment called HPP1, which, which uh, actually needs to go down a little bit more. It inhibits the transcriptional activity of beta catenin left TCF. OK. So the wind signaling pathway, um, so that are the details of the wind signaling. Oh, I, Forgot to mention one other detail, is that this, path, this uh, pathway is under substantial negative control, whether it be by tumor suppressor genes, APC, and axon, 
for colon, colorectal cancer, for liver, or negative control at the receptor level by uh, uh, SFRP proteins that sequester with ligand away from its receptor, DKK proteins that pre pre prevent an essential receptor co receptor interaction. Um, okay, so, so, so it's both it's positive control and negative control. But the wind signaling pathway itself is associated, as I said, with tumor stem cells and with metastatic disease uh, pro proliferation, but it's also important for normal development. When apparently regulated is, is when the pathological situations come, come about. And in some studies, the wind signaling, high wind signaling, has been concretely linked to TA, triple negative breast cancer and to brain metastases. And, and in this paper, what I thought was remarkable is they used a wind signaling uh, s s signature in a database of over a thousand breast cancer cases, of which some were triple negative. And the, wind si the having a wind signaling cassette pulled out the triple negative disease with a very high, with a very high percentage, a very good reliability. So substantiating that wind signaling is linked to the triple negative disease. One of the uh, newer findings with the wind pathway is that it's one of the pathways that's linked to a Warburg-like program of metabolic rearrangement. So this probably goes along with the fact that wind signaling regulates proliferation, since the Warburg uh, rearrangement um, is responsible for, uh, it puts a cell in, in, a, in a situation that favors proliferation. Okay, so, um, it, so, so, so in a, a, a brief slide, what, what, is, what is the Warburg effect? So, so the Warburg effect is a wholesale metabolic rearrangement. We, we know it most as, as uh, glucose going to lactic in aerobic glycolysis. And there's a lot of work on the Warburg effect. I'm gonna try to simplify it. So the differentiated tissues, they take glucose and metabolize it down to 36 ATP and, and water in an oxidative phosphorylation dependent fashion. So this doesn't leave any intermediates to synthesize the constituents of a cell for division, such as lipids, uh, amino acids, et cetera. Whereas in, in a Warburg, uh, in a Warburg uh, effect, a Warburg effect is often associated with proliferative cells. Glu glucose is metabolized to fewer ATP, and lactate is often a byproduct. But what this leaves is lots of intermediates that can be interchanged to make uh, amino acids, uh, 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 and, and lipids and nucleic acids. And, and in the Warburg effect, there is usually a switch of isoforms of many of the pathways we had to learn in biochemistry. And so it's really a complete metabolic rearrangement, um, usually for proliferative cells. Okay, so, so let me return to breast cancer. So one of the things that we, we've showed in our lab was that this uh, gene HPP1 is a transcriptional repressor and it's an inhibitor of, of wind signaling as part of a certain class of transcription factors. Um, and uh, the biology of it itself, apart from wind signaling, is it's an inhibitor of G1 progression and effector of oncogene mediated senescence. But what I'm going to focus on is this role as an inhibitor of wind, wind signaling and the fact it's mutated or reduced in breast cancers with a poor prognosis. And in particular, is that it is reduced in, in triple negative disease. So this is a clinical specimen screen versus triple negative breast cancers versus other types. So HPP1 is reduced. This is an in silico screen with essentially the same results. So HPP1 is low in triple negative breast cancers. So that is consistent with its possible function, its functional role as a WINT inhibitor. When an inhibitor is low, you expect activation of that pathway. So we, we, we do see that. And what we did was we did an RNAi knockdown, uh, shRNA knockdown of HPP, and we found a surprising result. But it's now fully consistent with the documented role of wind signaling in 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 regulating um, the, a Warburg-like effect. Because what we found when we knocked down HPP1 was we found this is actually we've have gone back to the uh, microarrays. We found over 300 genes that were altered with a pattern of a Warburg-like effect. There were increased glycolytic genes, increased expression of the Warburg isoforms, decreased oxidative phosphorylation, increased pentose phosphate shunt, and, and a lactate in a HVP knockdown cell was also increased. 
So the, how we have been doing our metabolomics is with uh, my uh, department collaborator, Jim Balea, who is an NMR metabolomics expert. So we chose NMR to make the, uh, delineate the metabolic changes because what well, we wanted to be in a position to translate our NMR results into new markers for breast cancer diagnosis. So, so, how, so, 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 how, so how would that work? So right now we're doing all the biochemistry, um, but every breast cancer patient here get, gets an MRI. And what you can do in an MRI is change the sequence of the MRI so that you can focus on a voxel or a box of the tumor. And, and if you know the spectrum, that this, the spectral area you want to look at, you, you can get chemical information in a non-invasive manner. So what we're trying to do is understand some of the, the NMR-based metabolomics as a prelude to designing new MRS markers. And our clinical collaborators are Jack Urban and, and Chetal Makim at the hospital. Okay, so to make a lot, of story, a, a lot of work short, what we found was that there was, um, and, we, and, and my part of the lab does the gene expression, the protein expression, Jim's lab does the metabolomics, and what we found was that when HCP was knocked down, one of the patterns that was increased was an increase in, 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 in lipids and lipid synthesis, and we pieced together an increase in citrate, and there were changes also at, at, this, at this level. So this is also consistent with the Warburg effect. There's an increase in fasten, uh, fatty acid synthesis, and increase in one of the Warburg isoforms, HK2. So this was a lot of effort to map both the gene expression and the metabolomics. Okay, now, so, so, so now with all these changes with wind signaling, and we also agree with the literature in terms of the metabolic changes, can we do anything about this? Um, so this is where we use our, 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 our brains, and I have to say we were actually fairly uh, lucky because um, we made some simple assumptions, but I guess we had the bravery to test them. Okay, so what we thought was that, that triple negative breast cancer, wind signaling has a large role. Um, and so how can we uh, block wind signaling? So what we would ultimately like to do from the pathway point of view is to increase the in inhibitors. And we knew inhibitors like SFRP1 and DKK1 were under epigenetic suppression. So can, can we use a compound like decidabine that's a DNA methyltransferase inhibitor? The other thing we wanted was um, maybe we're not as brave as others. We weren't interested in doing a compound screening library. What we wanted to do was to repurpose compounds that were already in clinical use. So decidabine is FDA approved for treating uh, myelodysplastic syndrome and off-target off for leukemias. And then another compound we chose was EGCG. This is a principal compound from green tea that we had shown independently for reasons uh, uninteresting why we began this project, is that it, in high levels in cell culture, blocked wind signaling, and it did it by increasing HBP1, an inhibitor of wind signaling. So we're t thinking of ways to induce inhibitors. So let me tell you a little bit more about the two compounds. So EGCG is epigallocatechin 3 gallate and it's the principal uh, compound in green tea. So some early epidemiology studies show that about five cups of green tea per, per day were associated in some uh, Japanese studies with reduced breast cancer, and there are many phase one clinical trials with green tea. So uh, the, these are the, the numbers on green tea, but I think the, the bottom line of what I'm gonna tell you in a few slides is that we use attainable dosing for green tea. So if we proceed forward to a clinical trial, the patients will, will not be drinking 10 gallons of green tea. And we've been very careful about doing our preclinical st studies this way. And, he, and, and here are some of the, the, the numbers um, that, that are associated with the maximum ingestion of, of green tea. So, so in our study, um, the concentration we use is this, and it's an equivalent of, of this amount, which is fu fully attainable in the maximum, um, in, in terms of, of a human. And what we are currently doing is refining this more in collaboration with David Greenblatt to look at the plasma concentration in mice. So this, based on other people's studies, would be a plasma concentration of that amount, and, and, and that is full, fully attainable. 
Okay, so that's the green tea part. And, and green tea, of course, has very good safety. It, it's one of the, uh, tea is the second most consumed beverage in the world after water. So, so we're pretty confident about this one. The other compound we use is decidabine, which is, uh, we also call D, D, DAC, which is uh, methyltransferase, a D, DNMT1 inhibitor. It is approved by the FDA for treatment of myelodysplastic syndrome and off-label for leukemia, so it's an inhibitor of DNMT1. And, and the consequence to hematologic malignancies is a re-expression of epigenetically silenced genes. But there's some, there are still things we don't understand about epigenetic regulation because not every gene is, is un, unsilenced with, with uh, decidabine. Um, so I'm not saying it's selective, but um, it, there, it, it's not a 100% uh, de de demethylating agent, okay? And, and the th key point about decidabine is right now there's no known efficacy in solid tumors. So, so he excuse me, here are the doses that we use, and just to make a long story short, what the, the dose we use in the preclinical study is also in the FDA, uh, uh, in the FDA approved range. So we have two compounds in, in use in other diseases that w we are seeking to combine. Okay, Okay. so this is an example of, of, of some of our data. We've done many mice, probably 50 or more at this point. And what we see is that EGCG DAC together d d d diminishes tri triple negative uh, breast cancers. So, so this, is, um, this is actually by tumor weight. When we palpate the tumors, we see a, a larger decrease in the tumor size. Um, but the exciting part to us is the following. It, because we have a model that recapitulates brain and other metastases, what we see is that the EGCG DAC treatment reduces the total number of brain metastases and specifically reduces the number of, uh, of, of brain metastases. So this is one of, the, and we learned this after we got this result, but, but both DAC and EGCG cross the, the, the blood-brain barrier in contrast to, to many other compounds that, that are used for breast cancer. Um, actually, we learned it from some epilepsy experiments in our lab as well. So, 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 so this compound combination differs from, from other options for breast cancer patients. Okay, so what is the, what's the mechanism of EGCG DAC? Um, and, you know, we had to, to work through the, the data. So, so be, be first, this is a, a, a tumor growth curve, and here's an, another example of untreated and treated tumors. And what this curve says, simply tells you is that only the co combination works. Neither compound works on its own. And this is an attempt towards perhaps stratifying the patients. If we use an HPP knockdown tumor, one in which HPP1 cannot rise, the, the, the EGCG DAC has, ha, that does not have the same effect as a wild type. So HPP levels must rise, okay? Um, so uh, we show that directly here um, using two, two different exons of, H, of the HVP1 gene is that the HVP levels rise with EGCG DAC treatment. And with EGCG DAC treatment is that there is a, a, an inhibition of wind, of wind signaling. So, so here's a control tumor and then here's one that's treated. There's a, a vast decrease in nuclear beta-catenin whereas the individual combinations themselves have, have no effect. And, and, and furthermore, what we see coincident with the decrease in beta catenin and the decrease in tumors and decrease in metastases is an elevation of wind pathway inhibitors, HPP1, DKK1, and, and, and SFRP1. So, the, the, so the, the, the treatment combination elevates wind signaling in, inhibitors. Um, so whenever I would present this work, I, I, I was always asked, well, EGCG and DAC are, are, are not targeted compounds. So what else do you think it does? So in an attempt to answer that question, and we're still in the process of analyzing this, we did an RNA-seq analysis. 
um, with treated and untreated tumors for, for, from our xenograft models. And for, the, for those of you that do the whole transcriptomic uh, analysis, these are the kind of things that, 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 that you get out of that. So we see changes, a decrease in cell movement, and we also see some changes in, in stem cell genes. So we went to look at the pathway, and it was a relief in that when beta catenin pathway was one of the top 15 pathways that, that was inhibited with EGCG DAC treatment. We had done much of the biochemistry before, but it's gratifying that an unbiased analysis reinforced that. There are other things that we're looking at right now in the, fe in, uh, in the future, we're now and, and in the future, is that there are changes in the that the epithelial ad adherence junction. In fact, one of the work done by a very talented Tufts undergraduate, Molly, has shown is that e adherent is, is elevated in this um, triple negative breast cancer cell, which normally would not have that. But so we're still investigating these things. Um, but we wanted to hammer this win uh, story one more time. Is we look, we use a custom WINT array. Um, in part to avoid making qPCR reagents to every single Wnt target on that RNA seq, we bought one array, and what we found uh, with Wnt targeting is that 89, 90% of the Wnt target genes were in fact inhibited by EGCG DAC treatment. That's the same data, but the EGCG DAC inhibited Wnt signaling, but it did one other thing that we we uh, have have studied, and in, in my lab, we do a lot of metabolomics with Jim Balea using the NMR, and, and this is um, a summary of his metabolomic analysis, and these is a principal component analysis showing um, EGCG-treated tumors and control tumors, so they're two separate populations in response to, response to the 50 metabolites that we looked at, um, so, so, so there is definitely a different population metabolically, and we found that EGCG DAC treatment reduced fasten levels, uh, a key enzyme for fatty acid biosynthesis, and HK2, a hexokinase associated with the Warburg effect, that both were decreased with EGCG. So EGCG DAC appears to reverse aspects of the Warburg effect. And, and, and here is two NMR ana analyses um, for st steady state metabolites done with proton NMR, and this one is a carbon, a C13 analysis, and this is a flux analysis in which we inject a C13 glucose and take a snapshot of the metabolism of the tumor at that time. So what we found out of all this to, to support the idea the Warburg effect is, uh, is, all is, is partially reversed is that, for example, lactate is decreased with EGCG DAC treatment as reflected by a decrease in uh, lactate in the C13 analysis. And another one that is reduced is, is alanine, which is a readout for, for, for pyruvate. So, so there's a decrease um, in, in the alanine as well, and a readout for amino acid biosynthesis. So we're still continuing to, 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 look, to look at this. And, and, and this has been something we've been looking at for some, some time. It, because these are two compounds, not, well, not quite sometimes. So these are two compounds that are also either in extensive use in clinical trial and, or FDA uh, approved. So what, what we've been doing over the last month is really, um, last, last month or more, is trying to package the studies into a phase one trial. So my partners in this is Saria Jelapan, Jack Urban, Ju Julian Wools. Saria is a neuro-oncologist. Jack is a breast oncologist. Ju Julian Wool is a neurosurgeon. And David Greenblatt is, is, a, is a pharmacologist. So we are trying to push the basic science studies over to the tra translational uh, spectrum and towards a phase one trial. So we've begun to configure a phase one trial, which we will, um, I'm going to guess in six months to a year, administer patients with uh, DAC and, and, with EG, and with EGCG. Okay. Okay. And, and these are my cal calculations on the, the tablets that, that, that we're going to, to use and, and, the, and the rough equivalents in, into the, the preclinical and the human models. Okay, so, so, so to summarize, what I've told you briefly today is that 
HVP1 and when signaling co coordinate a Warburg-like metabolism, and that the re there's reduced HVP1 in triple negative breast cancer relative to, to other sub subtypes, and, and that the HVP1 decreases, which lead to elevated wind signaling, have a widespread effect on met metabolic genes with alterations in the lipid metabolism. And the mechanism of EGCGDAC um, uh, to inhibit wind signaling works through elevating wind inhibitors, and, and that the EGCGDAC combination has much needed efficacy on brain metastases, also on primary triple negative disease. Um, and, and, it, and we think it works by, it works synergistically by elevating wind pathway inhibitors, but it also has an unexpected effect on attenuating a Warburg metabolism. So toward the phase one trial, our preclinical pre studies using doses that EGCG, DAC are, um, using doses that are attainable in humans, we think that both compounds, this will have excellent safety and this will have manageable side effects. And all the calculations and studies that have been done pre previously su suggest that there'll be predicted favorable plasma concentrations. So we're excited about uh, finally moving this uh, compound, hopefully, into a, a clinical trial. So, so these are the people in my lab that have done the work. Jim Balea's lab did that, the NMR analysis. Uh, some of the studies at the early part were a collaboration with Gail Sonnenschein and Nora Minerva in her lab. Uh, uh, together with them, we tested you know, I, I'm cognizant of Bill Sellers' talk with 100 cell lines. We, we did test one more triple negative cell line. Um, these, these are my cl uh, clinician partners, hopefully to bring this to the patient. Okay, with that, I'll stop and I'll take any questions. Thank you. If Gail could come up and reload your slides while we take one or two quick questions. Anyone? I had one. Oh. So, obviously, the hope is it's a 100% remission rate, but knowing that that likely won't be true, are there any early hypotheses on whether based on a transcriptomics or other studies, biomarkers of activity or resistance? Are you going to go into the study? I know it's just a phase one. Is there any kind of uh, intermediate biomarkers at all? Okay, so 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 one of the things when you're, as I understand, I've never, I'm a PhD, I've never done a clinical trial. One of the things that you, if you, let's say you have no effect on tumors, so so so, so is it no effect because your dosing was incorrect, or or or, or is it really doesn't work? So um, we're going to take a page from the Novartis playbook. So the, uh, so the wind signaling pathway has been difficult to drug, but there is one compound in clinical trials. And what they do is they take a skin biopsy um, and look at axon 2 expression. Axon 2 is a wind target gene. Skin happens to have high, high background of wind signaling. So, so, so if you have wind inhibition, then you should get a decrease in axon 2 expression. And we're going to pilot that here as well. But the wind signaling pathway, I think the reason it's been difficult to drug is I don't think an inhibitor that completely knocks out wind signaling is going to work because wind signaling is necessary for normal maintenance. So. Great. Any other questions? One, one more in the back, right there. As part of the phase one study, if there is, uh, if there is biopsy material present, do you look for HK2 expression? So there's this, there's stuff published previously about HK2 being upregulated in, in metastatic breast cancer and it was brain, right? Right. It, it, so, yeah, so I guess when we're, we're thinking about this, we're, we're counting on not getting biopsy material because one thing we're targeting our phase one trial to is patients with brain metastases who are actually often excluded from clinical trials, and, and, there, and there's a lot of them. So most of the brain tumors are, aren't treated by resection. So, so but, 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 but you are absolutely correct. There are um, a few papers that say that HK2 is increased, which also suggests a change in the metabolism as it goes, as the tumors go to the brain. It's a good question. Great. Thanks again, Dr. Yu. Okay.